Greg Mortensen is a former mountain climber, best-selling author, humanitarian, and philanthropist. His nonprofit organization, the Central Asia Institute, is dedicated to promoting education, especially for girls, in remote parts of Pakistan and Afghanistan, and according to its website, has established more than 140 schools there. President Obama donated $100,000 to the group from the proceeds of his Nobel Prize. Mortensen's book, Three Cups of Tea, has sold more than four million copies and has required reading for U.S. servicemen bound for Afghanistan. But last fall, we began investigating complaints from former donors, board members, staffers, and charity watchdogs about Mortensen and the way he is running his nonprofit organization. And we found there are serious questions about how millions of dollars have been spent, whether Mortensen is personally benefiting, and whether some of the most dramatic and inspiring stories in his books are even true. The story will continue in a moment. Greg Mortensen's books have made him a publishing phenomenon and a sought-after speaker on the lecture circuit, where he has attained a cult-like status. He regularly draws crowds of several thousand people and $30,000 per engagement. And everywhere Mortensen goes, he brings an inspirational message built around a story that forms the cornerstone of Three Cups of Tea and his various ventures. How, in 1993, he tried and failed to reach the summit of K2, the world's second tallest mountain, to honor his dead sister. How he got lost and separated from his party on the descent and stumbled into a tiny village called Corfe. My pants were ripped in half and I hadn't taken a bath in 84 days. And I stumbled into a little village called Corfe where I was befriended by the people. And they gave me everything they had, um, their yak, butter, their tea. They um, put warm blankets over me and for, they helped nurse me back to health. Mortensen tells how he discovered 84 children in the back of the village, writing their school lessons with sticks in the dust. When a young girl named Chocho came up to me and said, could you help us build a school? I made a rash promise that day and he said, I promise I'll help you build a school. And little did I know that, that would change my life forever. It's a powerful and a heartwarming tale that has motivated millions of people to buy his books and to contribute nearly $60 million to his charity. It's a beautiful story, and it's a lie. John Krakauer is also a best-selling author and mountaineer who wrote Into Thin Air and Into the Wild. He was one of Mortensen's earliest backers, donating $75,000 to his nonprofit organization. But after a few years, Krakauer says he withdrew his support over concerns that the charity was being mismanaged. And he later learned that the Corfe tale that launched Mortensen into prominence was simply not true. Did he stumble into this village in a weakened state? Absolutely not. So nobody, nobody helped him out and nursed him back to health? Absolutely not. I, I have spoken to one of his companions, a close friend, who hiked out from K2 with him. This companion said, Greg never heard of Corfe till a year later. Strangely enough, Krakauer's version of events is backed up by Greg Mortensen himself in his earliest telling of the story. In an article he wrote for the newsletter of the American Himalayan Foundation after his descent from K2, Mortensen makes no mention of his experience in Corfe, although he did write that he hoped to build a school in another village called Kane. We managed to track down the two porters who accompanied Mortensen and spoke to them in Pakistan's remote Hushe Valley. They also told us that Mortensen didn't stumble into Corfe lost and alone, and that he didn't go to Corfe at all until nearly a year later on another visit. He did build a school in Corfe. He did, and it's a good thing. But if you go back and read the first few chapters of that book, you realize I'm being taken for a ride here. One of the most compelling experiences I had was in July of 96. It's not a solitary example. Upon close examination, some of the most touching and harrowing tales in Mortensen's books appear to have been either greatly exaggerated or made up out of whole cloth. I went into the area to find a place to build a school. What happened is I got kidnapped by the Taliban for eight days. The kidnapping story was featured in Three Cups of Tea and referred to in his follow-up bestseller, Stones into Schools, with his 1996 photograph of his alleged captors. We managed to locate four men who were there when the photo was taken. Two of them actually appear in the picture. 
All of them insist they're not Taliban and that Greg Mortensen was not kidnapped. They also gave us another photo of the group with Mortensen holding the AK-47. One of the men, Mansoor Khan Masood, is the research director of a respected think tank in Islamabad and has produced scholarly articles published in the U.S. Until recently, he had no idea that he'd been shown as a kidnapper in a best-selling book. That's me. We spoke with Masood via Skype. He told us that he and the other people in the photograph were Mortensen's protectors in Waziristan, not his abductors. The story, as Mr. Mortensen tells it, is that he was held for eight days and won you over by asking for a Koran and promising to build schools in the area. Is that true? This is totally false and he is lying. He was not kidnapped. Who are these people that are also in the picture? Some are my cousin, some are uh, our uh, friends from our village. Well, why do you think Mr. Mortensen would write this? To sell his book. Another place where no one has done much checking is into the financial records of Mortensen's non-profit organization, the Central Asia Institute, which builds and funds the schools in Pakistan and Afghanistan and is located in Bozeman, Montana, where Mortensen lives. He says the charity took in $23 million in contributions last year, some of it from thousands of school children who emptied their piggy banks to help its Pennies for Peace program and some of it from large fundraisers like this one in Santa Clara, California. We've got 1,500 bid here. you got to get to that school getting built, ladies and gentlemen, tonight. This organization has been around for 14 years. How many audited financial statements has it issued? One. What? It's amazing that they could get away with that. Daniel Borokov is president of the American Institute of Philanthropy, which has been examining and rating charitable organizations for the last two decades. He says the Central Asia Institute's financial statements show a lack of transparency and a troublesome intermingling of Mortensen's personal business interests with the charity's public purpose. According to the documents, the nonprofit spends more money domestically promoting the importance of building schools in Afghanistan and Pakistan than it does actually constructing and funding them overseas. What's surprising is that most of the program spending is not to help kids in Pakistan and Afghanistan. It's actually their what they call domestic outreach where he goes around the country speaking and the costs incurred for that. Things like travel is a major component of that. You know, just advertising. What does that mean? Sounds like a book tour to me. His point is that when Greg Mortensen travels all over the country at the charity's expense, he is promoting and selling his books and collecting speaking fees that the charity does not appear to be sharing in. According to the financial statement, the charity receives no income from the bestsellers and little, if any, income from Mortensen's paid speaking engagements, while listing $1.7 million in book-related expenses. The $1.7 million that they spent for book-related expenses is more than they spent on all of their schools in Pakistan last year. Correct. What do you say? I mean, it's disappointing. You would hope that, that they would be spending a lot more on the schools in Pakistan than they would on, on, on book-related costs. Why doesn't Mr. Mortensen spend his own money on the book-related costs? He's the one getting the revenues. In fiscal year 2009, the charity spent $1.5 million on advertising to promote Mortensen's books in national publications, like this full-page ad in The New Yorker and there are $1.3 million in domestic travel expenses, some of it for private jets. Late last night, we received a statement from the board of directors of the Central Asia Institute, acknowledging that it receives no royalties or income from Greg Mortensen's book sales or speaking engagements. But the board says the books and the speeches are an integral part of its mission by raising public awareness and generating contributions. And it claims that Mortensen has personally contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars to the organization. But the American Institute of Philanthropy is not persuaded. So I don't think the charity's getting a fair share here based on the financial reports that I've reviewed. Do you think the contributors are being misled? I think so. And so does John Krakauer, who says it's been going on for a long time. In 2002, his board treasurer quit, resigned, along with the board president and two other board members, and said, you should stop giving money to Greg. Did he say why? 
he said in so many words that Greg uses uh, Central Asia Institute as his private ATM machine, that there's no accounting, he has no receipts. Over the years, a half a dozen staffers and board members have resigned over similar concerns, especially about money Mortensen has sent overseas to build schools. You know, nobody is overseeing what, what goes on. He doesn't know how many schools he's built. Nobody knows how much these schools cost. The IRS tax return Central Asia Institute filed last year included a list of 141 schools that it claimed to have built or supported in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Over the past six months, we visited or looked into nearly 30 of them. Some were performing well, but roughly half were empty, built by somebody else, or not receiving support at all. Some were being used to store spinach or hay for livestock. Others had not received any money from Mortensen's charity in years. The principal of this school told us that the institute had built six classrooms poorly several years ago, and since then, not a single rupee. In Afghanistan, we could find no evidence that six of the schools even existed, most of them in war-torn Kunar province. In Kona province, it's really violent. He built three schools there in 2009. So he goes on Charlie Rose. He says he built 11 schools in Kunar province. Today we have 11 schools also in that district. Why can't he just say he built three? I mean, that's impressive. You say he built 11, I go, why are you lying about this? One of the schools we looked into in Afghanistan is this one in Bozoy Gumbaz, a remote outpost in the Wakhan Corridor on the roof of the world. Mortensen's second book, Stones into Schools, begins with Abdul Rashid Khan, the leader of a semi-nomadic people, sending horsemen to summon Mortensen to his camp. The book ends with Khan on his deathbed, ordering every available yak in the high Pamir to haul supplies for a school that will serve 200 children. But Ted Callahan, an anthropologist who spent nearly a year in the area, says the story doesn't ring true. The number of children that this one school is going to educate, that's just nonsense. The words that Abdul Rashid Han says in this book, this is a man who probably came to my tent every day for an hour or two, and the man that I knew is not the man who's portrayed in this book. You seem to be saying that most of it is BS. The most generous thing I could say is that it's, it's grossly exaggerated, and probably the harshest thing I could say is, is a lot of it just sounds like outright fabrication. Today the school sits empty, and we're told by a tribal leader that it's never been used. No one's there. No one's there at all. You know, I think at best it might end up being used as a, as a storage shed for stuff. We obviously wanted to talk to Greg Mortensen, who has appeared on just about every news and talk show on television, but he didn't want to talk to 60 Minutes. He dismissed our initial request for an interview last fall, and our follow-up messages and emails over the past two weeks have gone unanswered. We finally decided to seek him out at a speaking engagement and book signing in Atlanta. Steve Croft. Nice to meet you. How you doing? Thanks. You got five minutes for us today? Um, I need to sign these books right now, so... Yeah, I know. I, you know, we haven't heard from... It's been almost a week we haven't heard from you or the board, and we're just trying to... I need to sign I don't want to disrupt this. But well, you're already disrupting it, so... Okay. Thanks. Can we come back? We'll wait for you. Thanks. Hey, how are you? Mortensen's staff immediately contacted hotel security, which asked us to leave. They told us if we retired to the lobby, one of his staff members would stop by or call us to discuss a possible interview. They never did. Mortensen canceled his afternoon appearance and left the hotel through a back entrance. He's not Bernie Madoff. I mean, let's be clear. He has done a lot of good. He has helped thousands of school kids in Pakistan and Afghanistan. He has become perhaps the world's most effective spokesperson for girls' education in developing countries, and he deserves credit for that. Nevertheless, he is now threatening to bring it all down, to destroy all of it by, by, by this fraud and by these lies. In the last few days, we received two statements from Greg Mortensen saying that he stood by the information in his books and the value of his charity's work. He called the attacks against him unjustified.